In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Welcome to the Cathedral on this weekend when our diocese gives thanks to God for the life and ministry of Thomas Cantaloupe, the 45th Bishop of Hereford, whose shrine here in the Cathedral became a focus for pilgrimage and a place of healing where many Christians were made whole by the grace of God and given new life in Christ. As we begin our worship, let us open our hearts to him who makes all things new as we pray together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Saints were faithful unto death and now dwell in the heavenly kingdom forever. As we celebrate their joy, let us bring to the Lord our sins and weaknesses and ask for his mercy. Most merciful God, we confess to you before the whole company of heaven and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and in what we have failed to do. Forgive us our sins, heal us by your Spirit, and raise us to new life in Christ. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us continue in prayer. Almighty God, glorified in all your saints, who gave grace to your servant Thomas of Hereford, steadfastly to resist evil and uphold justice. Grant that we who commemorate his holy life and angelic virtues may likewise live blamelessly and rebuke vice, that we may win with him an eternal crown through our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. Reading from the Letter to the Hebrews. By faith Noah, warned by God about events as yet unseen, respected the warning and built an ark to save his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir to the righteousness that is in accordance with faith. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out for a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. He set out not knowing where he was going. By faith he stayed for a time in the land he had been promised, in a foreign land, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. All of these died in faith, without having received the promises, but from a distance they saw and greeted them. They confessed that they were strangers and foreigners on the earth. For people who speak in this way make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of the land they had left behind, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Indeed, he has prepared a city for them. For the word of the Lord, thanks be to God.
The Lord be with you. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Jesus said, Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. Who then is the faithful and wise slave, whom his master has put in charge of his household, to give the other slaves their allowance of food at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master will find at work when he arrives. This is the Gospel of the Lord. This is a year of extraordinary anniversaries. We've commemorated VJ Day, the 75th anniversary of the ending of the Second World War in the Far East. Meanwhile, in Canterbury, in spite of the restrictions imposed by COVID-19, they've been commemorating the 850th anniversary of the martyrdom of Thomas Beckett. And, of course, in Hereford, you've been honouring the 700th anniversary of the canonisation of another Thomas, Thomas Cantaloupe, who was Bishop of Hereford from 1275 until his death in 1282. Not to outdo you, in the Diocese of Exeter, we've been commemorating an anniversary of our own. We've been celebrating the 400th anniversary of the sailing from Plymouth of the Mayflower, bearing the Pilgrim Fathers away to the American colonies as they sought a new homeland and a new life. Words from our first reading from the letter to the Hebrews really do apply to them. They confessed that they were but strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Those who speak in this way make it clear that they're seeking a homeland of their own. Given that this intrepid band of Puritan separatists sailed to America in order to get away from the dreadful Church of England and above all from nasty bishops, it's quite a tricky subject for a bishop to preach on. St Thomas of Hereford, on the other hand, is a much easier proposition, though as you know only too well, his own life was shot through with tragedy. But why do we honour him, or indeed any of those to whom we attach the label saint? There are various answers to that question. My own is entirely pragmatic. Humankind have always needed its heroes and its celebrities, and the saints fulfil that role for Christians. The ancient Greeks had Achilles, Athletes have Usain Bolt and Jessica Ennis. Football enthusiasts idolise Cristiano Ronaldo and Harry Kane. And Christians have saints. They are the church's first eleven. Admittedly, not all the saints are instinctively attractive. St Simon of St Simon Stylitis, who lived in Turkey in the 5th century, spent the majority of his life on top of a pillar hurling down abuse on adulterers and fornicators. And I note that there aren't any churches dedicated to him in the Diocese of Hereford. He wasn't immediately attractive, but then not all our sporting heroes and TV celebrities are either. The truth is, we are all called to be saints. In the New Testament, we're all saints because we're all on this journey of personal transformation, becoming the women and men that God longs for us to be. Those individuals to whom we attach the title saint are singled out because they embody the life of a gospel in a special way. They, they enable us to get a grip on what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And as a result, they help shape our lives. They are, if you like, God's 
mirrors reflecting his light and love into our hearts. They're saying God is great and his grace is abundant. God is with you and he won't let you go. Or to change the metaphor, they are God's prism, refracting the white light of the gospel into a spectrum of colour, demonstrating through their lives different ways of being a disciple of Jesus. And in so doing, they give us permission to be ourselves and to follow God's call wherever he may be leading us. What unites them is the way that their lives are characterised by the values Jesus sets out in the Beatitudes in the Sermon of the Mount. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are peacemakers. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst to see justice prevail. Blessed are the merciful. Now, we do call these pithy stayings of Jesus Beatitudes, but... They might better be called God's attitudes, not least because they stand in sharp contrast to the values which often shape our world. Here are attitudes to life, says Jesus, which will transform your relationships and allow God to bless you. The challenge is for us and indeed for every generation, whether we've got the courage to pick up the baton and engage with those Beatitudes, allowing them to shape our lives as once they shaped the life of Thomas Cantilou. Thomas was born in Buckinghamshire, but we don't hold that against him. I was born in Essex and I've been reinventing myself ever since. Of noble stock, Thomas was precociously bright. He taught law at the University of Oxford and at the University of Paris and was elected Chancellor of Oxford University, not once, but twice. In 1265, he was appointed by the King Lord Chancellor of England and ten years later, at the age of 57, he was appointed Bishop of Hereford. Thomas was a person of energy as well as intelligence, a man who led from the front. Arriving in Hereford, he found the cathedral in diocese in poor shape and disrepair and really disorganised. The morale of the clergy was low and the life of the parishes at a low ebb. Like the servant in the gospel whom the master put in charge of his household, Thomas was diligent and well organised. He initiated various reforms and gave priority to the education of the clergy, recognising that if you want to effect growth and change then you need to invest in your frontline troops. I'm not sure just how much fun Thomas was. He was an ascetic, incredibly self-disciplined and a bit intense. But he was the man for the moment. Until, that is, there was a change in the national leadership of the church. With the election of John Peckham as Archbishop of Canterbury, things changed. Archbishop Peckham was in many ways an admirable man, but from the extensive correspondence that survived, it's clear that he could be arrogant and petulant. He treated his fellow bishops with disdain that bordered on contempt, and it wasn't long before the two men came into outright conflict. Peckham treated him as if he was an ignorant skivvy. Thomas objected to the centralising attempts of the new archbishop to command and control dioceses and unbelievably in 1282 Archbishop Peckham excommunicated Thomas for daring to oppose him. How these Christians love one another. 
It's a salutary tale for our own day, and from it I take three things. First, recovery and growth emerge best from local initiatives, not from people remote from a situation in Canterbury, or dare I say Westminster, handing down orders from on high. Local, local, local. Secondly, as Christians, we do have to manage conflict better and learn to disagree well, shouting at one another, like megaphone diplomacy, never works and simply brings the church into disrepute. And thirdly, we have to model living with difference for the sake of our world. The rest of Thomas's life you know well. In the face of his excommunication, he travelled to Rome to plead his cause before the Pope. Tragically, he died en route home to England outside the town of Orvieto and eventually was reburied back in England in Hereford Cathedral. This weekend, 700 years ago, the man was finally vindicated when he was canonised by Pope John XXII. And as a consequence, it's St Thomas of Hereford that we remember, not John Peckham, his arch-protagonist. Thomas knew that life and love are enlarged by faith and also by the, our deepest vo vocation and witness comes through our glimpses of God in our daily life. In words from the letter to the Hebrews, Thomas knew that here we have no abiding city, but we look for a better country, the heavenly country that is to come. This autumn, as we face a possible second wave of infections, we need Thomas to call us back to the one living God, the source of our life and our hope, because there's no other foundation on which we can build our lives securely. Let me conclude with a story. The unknown writer to the Hebrews tells us that we're surrounded by a huge great cloud of witnesses. It's a very memorable phase. This unseen army of men and women who accompany us on our pilgrimage through life. Some years ago, while staying with friends in California, they took me to see the new cathedral in Los Angeles. The text from Hebrews was the inspiration for the commissioning of two enormous tapestries that are hung on either side of the cathedral, reaching the length of the cathedral nave. And on it are woven larger than life-size figures of the apostles, the saints and the martyrs, hundreds of men and women from every century, culture and continent right up to the present day with figures like Oscar Romero, the murdered Archbishop of San Salvador, people like Martin Luther King and Mother Teresa of Calcutta. I doubt whether St Thomas of Hereford is represented in that gigantic tapestry. But as I knelt in that cathedral, what struck me forcibly about the tapestry was that unlike in most churches and cathedrals where the saints are represented either looking out at us or looking down at us as if they've made it and we haven't, here the saints and the congregation all faced the same way. They faced east towards the altar as if their gaze and our gaze is focused on Jesus, our crucified and risen Lord. Kneeling there, it felt as if the saints were 
They were my friends, my companions on this journey, praying alongside me, as if they were saying, we're in this together. In words of a hymn that we often sing, we're pilgrims on a journey, we're travellers on the road, we're here to help each other, to walk the mile and bear the load. So on this special anniversary, let's rejoice in their company. And as we journey to our heavenly homeland, may St Thomas of Hereford pray for us. May Our Lady pray for us. May King Ethelbert the King pray for us. And may God himself give us his blessing of peace. Amen. In the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. Hail Thomas, good shepherd of Christ's flock, protector and doctor in the church. To the sick, give help, we pray, and to the faithful, bring the light of grace. Heavenly Father, we remember today your servant, Thomas Cantaloupe, as he cared for and prayed for your creation, so do we. Lord, hear us. Thomas Cantaloupe, faithful, hardworking, conscientious pastor in the Hereford Diocese, we pray for all bishops and clergy, and especially for our own faithful, hard-working pastors in the diocese, this diocese, and in the Diocese of Exeter. We remember, too, those who are being ordained as deacon or priest at this time. Lord, hear us. Thomas Cantaloupe, Chancellor of England. We pray for our politicians in their struggle to manage the coronavirus epidemic. 
and to lead us safely through the complexities of Brexit. Grant them wisdom and guidance to complete this process for the benefit of all. Lord, hear us. Thomas Cantaloupe, once a student at Oxford and in Paris. We pray for all young people, starting at universities, colleges, and places of learning in these troubled times. We pray for all teachers, lecturers, and mentors as they offer guidance and support to their students and seek to inspire them. Lord, hear us. Saint Thomas Cantaloupe, miracles of healing followed your death. We ask your blessing, Heavenly Father, on all those seeking health and healing today, especially those for whom prayers have been asked at this shrine of Saint Thomas. We remember those who have died recently and those whose anniversaries we commemorate at this time and all those who have died in the coronavirus epidemic. We name Paul Harris, B. Tabor, Graham Lloyd, Priest, Errol Hughes, Alwyn Bulbeck, Richard Lewis. Lord, hear us. Almighty God, by your Holy Spirit, you have made us one with your saints in heaven and on earth. Grant that in our earthly pilgrimage we may ever be supported by this fellowship of love and prayer and know ourselves surrounded by their witness to your power and mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us unite these and all our prayers in the words our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. God give you grace to follow Thomas Cantaloupe and all his saints in faith and hope and love. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.